Professor Rosenberg. You have chosen Fabricius's The Goldfinch uh, for our conversation today. And I'm wondering if maybe you can just tell us a little bit about this painting and why you chose it. Well, uh, I went to graduate school initially uh, 12,000 years ago to, uh, to uh, study 17th century Dutch art. And uh, uh, over the first couple of years uh, in, in a PhD program, I migrated uh, forward chronologically uh, uh, to the 19th and early 20th centuries for a number of reasons. Uh, and um, and uh, out of 17th century Dutch art to 19th and early 20th century American uh, art. Uh, and uh, and uh, sort of left the more intensive study of, of 17th century Dutch painting uh, behind uh, for much of my uh, career up to now. But in recent years, uh, the, that, that original interest has kind of resurfaced uh, fairly strongly. Uh, and uh, part of that uh, came about as a result of uh, manifesting a desire that I think had been there all along uh, to try my hand at, at writing something about this particular painting. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I kind of said about that, uh, at, I'm not sure anymore how long ago it was because it's kind of gone in fits and starts up to now uh, over the last, uh, uh, seven, eight years or so, you know, kind, kind of when I could, because I, it's not like I gave up on, uh, on uh, 19th and 20th century American art or history of photography, um, which are the areas that, uh, that I've more consistently uh, written, researched, and, and, and published in. Um, and uh, but but uh, but in in moments I would turn myself uh, to this uh, picture, and in part it, it it's just been a, a lifelong uh, uh, favorite uh, work of uh, uh, of mine. I mean, it is for many people, of course. Um, uh, and I always have to stop myself around here for a moment and qualify this interest uh, with the uh, with the sidebar. Uh, so to speak, uh, that uh, uh, my uh, my immersion in the picture, in addition to coming to love it years ago, uh, but more recently to actually try to write about it, um, did commence before uh, uh, Donna Tartt's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Goldfinch, was anywhere. It, it, it didn't exist no knowledge of it, anything. It was at least a few years prior to that time, because, you know, how could you help yourself? You tell somebody today, oh, I'm working on the goldfinch, and the thing that comes to mind naturally, of course, mm -hmm. is, you know, we're in, it, uh, we're, we're more in the moment in a sense of that novel, partially about the painting, than we are in the moment of the payment paintings, you know, place in the popular imagination. Right. So anyway, um, and so I've, you know, continued to uh, sort of knock away at it in, from various vantage points. <laughs> Great. So you mentioned the Dutch Golden Age um, as a period in the history of art um, that I also find really fascinating. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how that context sort of gave rise to this painting, how that might have affected its creation. Sure. Well, I think uh, I think the aspect of that uh, uh, that of your question that uh, interests me the most is that uh, it is uh, what's often thought of as the 17th, in general, 17th century European uh, explosion of interest in, uh, in uh, science and philosophy uh, that, that often can be seen as a sort of um, uh, uh, one of the first steps toward uh, modernity. And uh, and even uh, even modernism, and uh, I began from the standpoint that uh, here was a, a moment that perhaps could uh, both in the picture and in a moment, meaning the picture and and the the particular moment in 17th century Dutch art uh, when it's it's actually painted, 
uh, that uh, might be able to tell us something about the, uh, what I think of as kind of the limits of uh, painting at this time. I mean, how far could painting be pushed as a realm of uh, theorization of the world, philosophy of the world, um, rumination upon uh, paintings project to capture something of reality, which on the one hand is extraordinarily important for 17th century Dutch artists, and at the same time is rife with uh, with uh, uh, issues as to how much of, of, of that can really be uh, realized in, in uh, paint. Um, and uh, it, it struck me more and more that uh, that the goldfinch was an instance where one might tease out of uh, out of concentrated looking and attention to it uh, as some sense, some version of those uh, of those uh, of those limits. And along that way, I came to uh, feel very much that rather than this being uh, what what is is I think most commonly um, described as its kind of purpose or intention, a kind of trompe l'oeil uh, picture, um, uh, rather that that it is a, a sort of field of experimentation, actually a visual field of experimentation. It, it started to look to me simply like some kind of equation was being worked out it, it visually by way of paint on a flat surface. Um, and how that realized image, but also relationships of form and, uh, and illusions of space uh, and so on and so forth. And from there, from you know, once once the terms experiment and equation, which you know, a, a, a experiment especially shouldn't be thought of as necessarily foreign to you know the the extant literature on seventeenth century Dutch uh, art. Uh, we are, after all, we're in Delft and we're in you know we're at the the the, the beginning of the moment of um, of uh, Vermeer. Uh, uh, a sense of painting as experimental in, in, in a way. Um, uh, um, uh, at the same time, this kind of got me reading in um, uh, areas of, uh, of uh, thinking at the time, such as the mathematization of natural philosophy uh, as, as, as an investigation of 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 what uh, what nature's language might necessarily uh, be, and and Delft, I mean, Fabricius could not have been more uh, uh, contiguous with, uh, and even immersed in potentially um, uh, a host of uh, a host of scientific and philosophic thinkers who are working on these very. Uh, problems, the nature of gravity, the nature of free fall, um, uh, even as specific as uh, uh, the, the, the uh, nature of what's called a catenary, the free fall of a, um, of, of, a, of, a of, of, of chainal links, um, uh, which is, you know, what we, we see literally, the, the, the similarity between the uh, falling uh, looping chain uh, that is ostensibly a tether uh, for uh, the goldfinch here uh, is, is almost a double of uh, Christian Huygens' uh, drawing of an experimental drawing of a catenary uh, hanging chain and the type of, me of fields of measurement of, of, of uh, the world that were being made possible as a result of working out these relations. Um, so things like that, you know, began to flower in my brain, at least whether they're convincing to anybody else is another question, but, you know, it just kept my interest going. Yeah, um, no, that's fascinating. Um, so moving beyond this painting alone a little bit, um, I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about just the role that animals play in your own life, either in your work oh, wow. um, or even beyond that, just in your personal life. 
well, gosh, I mean, I wasn't necessarily expecting, well, I kind of had a little bit of a feeling that maybe that, that if we went far enough, this could become emotive, uh, but I'll try to keep a rein on things. Um, <laughs> um, animals, uh, well, I'm going to just start from the more personal, you know, I mean, I, I'm always interested in how animals manifest in art. And I have to say, I uh, as I thought more and more about our encounter today and and the extraordinary opportunity that you afford me of speaking a little bit about these interests. Um, uh, I, I actually became quite torn as to which image I would I would do because there I would talk about because there are, I mean, I've worked on the goldfinch in a sense the most um, of of animal images, uh, uh, but there are you know there are a handful of others that I consider to be. Uh, you know, amongst my very, very favorite uh, artworks. Uh, one is, I'm going to blank on the title, but it's that Kayabat of the, uh, I think it's the Pont de l'Europe, uh, where you have figures on the bridge in Paris, the, you know, crossing the Seine, and they're in different kind of everyday poses that you would expect of the bourgeoisie crossing the Seine and a worker or two. Um, uh, but, but, uh, from immediate foreground uh, uh, into the picture, into the picture plane and the illusion with its back to us walking away from the viewer, almost as if it's us, is a dog. Um, uh, ostensibly the central figure of the picture, not the largest, but, but in some ways the central. It's utterly fascinating. Um, uh, as well as there's something being unbelievably poignant about this animal walking away from us, but doubling our position at the same time, what we might imagine our position. Uh, so I was torn, actually, in the end. I thought about that a little bit, and, and I've written, actually, in published form, uh, um, I'm still working on the goldfinch stuff. God knows when that will come to utter fruition or whatever that means. Um, but I have act, published on Copley's, uh, John Singleton Copley's um, Boy with a Squirrel from the uh, MFA collection, um, uh, his 1765 painting. Uh, um, but animals have have loomed very, very, very large uh, uh, for me throughout uh, throughout life. Um, and uh, 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 I grew up. There were a couple of dogs in my early years. Uh, our family didn't have an enormous amount of success with dogs. Um, uh, we, we, we just weren't built that way. I'll qualify that by saying I love dogs. I love dogs. Uh, but I just not quite built in such a way as to do utter justice to taking, you know, to take to parenting, if that's the right word, a dog. Um, uh, it probably isn't, but uh, um, uh, but uh, but cats have have been a mainstay uh, uh, since I was uh, probably around. Uh, uh, well, no, I was going to say five or six, but in fact, I had my first cat, uh, Orange Tabby, uh, when I was probably th between three and four. Um, uh, and uh, and, and there have been cats consistently, uh, and now, uh, m m uh, about a year and a half ago, my wife Miriam and I uh, adopted our most recent two which is the third pair in 40 years that we've had. And uh, they're just, uh, they loom as large as could be. You know, they're, they're we, we, uh, uh, we've never had children. And, and in a sense, I guess there are, they've been, the cats successively have been, have kind of played that role without, you know, without, uh, <laughs> We don't get weird about it or anything. <laughs> I think our relationships with our cats are as you know naturally you know normative as anybody's who are who you know or who love the hell out of their cats, um, and uh, they loom very very large. You know, there's there's a certain type of bond that one can forge with with animals that's different. It's not better. You know, I mean, it's not better than the bonds with humans. Uh, I, I've never felt that. 
um, but it's it's different and and can be equally satisfying um, uh, and and edifying and and enriching and uh, and uh, that's always been the case uh, always been the case for me. Sorry, I feel like I'm probably going on a bit. Now. Oh no, not at all. That's that's all right. I totally agree. I've always had cats too growing up, so I definitely understand that relationship and that bond. Um, but finally, before we wrap up, I'm just wondering, are you working on any projects right now? I know you mentioned continuing research on the goldfinch, but is there anything else that you want to share about the work that you're doing right now? Just in general or animal oriented? Either. Oh, uh, gosh. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> maybe this will get me off my uh, duff, so to speak. Is, <laughs> is that the most decorous word for it? Um, uh, a little bit. But I, I've, um, I had the opportunity, if you, well, I'll be very honest about this. If you'd asked me five minutes before the opportunity came to me, what artist and what, and more particularly, what work by that artist do you know to within an inch of your life you will leave this mortal coil never having worked on by choice. I would have said Andrew Wyeth as artist and Chris, Christina's world as the painting, you know, his most famous mm -hmm. painting. Because um, uh, I just never was a Wyeth fan. And, and, uh, and, and so the one that has just kind of invaded the popular imagination to to as great an extent as almost anything except the Mona Lisa and uh, and I'm not sure what else some you know probably well I'm not sure what else um, uh, just you know uh, 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 you know how do you draw that back out of uh, such a context and try to say something about it even if you wanted to. Um, uh, uh, and, and then five minutes later, the opportunity fell into my lap for a project that someone else is, is, is spearheading um, uh, to contribute something and, you know, never one to look a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, I thought, well, okay, here's a challenge. If this is the last thing in the history of the world I ever wanted to write on, let's see if I can write something on it which resulted in about a with which in a resulted in a far too long contribution to a collection that will be all essays rethinking Christina's world by various people and uh, but now for some reason between lockdown and uh, and everything else of the last year or so it's just horribly overdue to be uh, revised and sent back in so uh, but I, 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 I'm, it's something I'm planning to get back to very shortly. That's kind of the most, the most recently commenced project. Um, just thinking here for a second that what, what uh, uh, I've long uh, been kind of tinkering with, uh, uh, written a few papers about the uh, abstract painter Richard Diebenkorn, a kind of California abstract expressionist in a sense. Uh, and I'd like to I'd like to get back to sort of pushing those along a bit uh, as well in the near future. Great. Well, I think that's everything I have. Um, do you have any concluding thoughts or anything before we go? Uh, just just to say, I you know I admire you your you and your cohort enormously for putting together this. Uh, this uh, symposium, and I think you know that the, the one could hardly find a more worthy uh, theme uh, for it. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, well, I'll just say this. Uh, you know, I think you've you're 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 forwarding a a, a topic that uh, speaks to so many different uh, aspects of our existence and how it's represented and how we represent it and uh but uh but you know no, nothing happens uh um uh without you know our working as hard as possible to foster uh codependency and and to to understand how we are we all creatures are codependent and uh and uh and you know i i just applaud you all for for moving this forward. Thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it.
Oh, I appreciate it. A golden opportunity. No pun intended. A golden opportunity. <laughs> and now uh, <laughs> I'll return to the, the chained tethering of lockdown and uh, <laughs> get back to preparing classes for the next day. <laughs> no, but wonderful. I can't thank you and your, your cohort enough.